How's it going everybody? It's Rosine here for Astrophotography. In today's tutorial, I'll be showing you how to edit narrowband imaging, specifically hydrogen alpha. So hydrogen alpha is probably the most popular form of narrowband because it's most of the time it's where the most detail lies in emission nebulae. Also, it's the one that people use for HARGB composite imaging, which will be a future tutorial. Anyway, so this image was shot with a modified Canon 600D, an astronomic 12 nanometer HA filter, and the Skywatcher EvoStar 80ED, and this is of the Flaming Star Nebula. I'll be pointing out some of the points uh, worth noting about where narrowband imaging differs to regular imaging editing. So anyway, we're going to get on. We're going to start here. And the first thing I'm going to do is just point out that I'm going to be using the histogram, the layers, channels, and navigator for this tutorial. If any of these aren't on show for you, you can just go to view and studio. Also, the first thing I'm going to do is resize this image because my laptop does not like screen recording and image editing at the same time. So I'll go to document and resize document. I'll change this to 1920 and just press resize. Normally I resize and crop at the end of my editing because that gives me the most real estate in pixels to do cropping to any aspect ratio I want or what size I want to crop to. Also while you're editing it gives you more pixels to play with whilst you're doing your edits and usually I find makes for a higher quality end picture. So as you may notice this image is very dark. Most time out of a DSLR, the image will be somewhat bright because raw files have a form of pre-processing on them. However, hydrogen alpha and narrowband imaging blocks most of that out. So it's a very dark image to start with. What we're gonna do is start by raising the brightness of this image. So we're gonna to go to adjustments here and make a curves adjustment. Quick note on the histogram is that the left-hand side of the histogram represents the black part of the image. The right hand side represents the white part of the image and in between you have shadows midtones and highlights the height of the peak of the histogram represents how many pixels are in that point so if we could see it we can see it on here all the information is on the left hand side because the image is very black very dark so i'm just going to click in the middle and i'm going to pull this curve up to the left here like this and then i'm just going to smooth the top off like that and you may have seen the histogram on this side move up and you can see it kind of beginning to happen. We're gonna to have to do this two or three times. I find it better to use many smaller curve adjustments than one really big aggressive curve. So that's another one. And each time you can see the histogram on the right hand side raising further and further and further up. And every time I'm doing this, I'm not letting this curve top out on the ceiling of the adjustment here and you can just about begin seeing some of the flaming star nebula appear this is enough for now and you can see all this noise and mottling appearing on the image that's because we've for lack of a better term not finalized the adjustments and to do that you can go to layer and merge visible and this is what we're left with now one difference is you can spot that this image is very red. The reason for this is because of where the data is on a narrowband hydrogen alpha image. If you look at the spectrum, then hydrogen alpha is up there in the red part of the image. Same with sulfur two. Oxygen three and hydrogen beta are down in towards the blue and cyan side. So it stands to reason that there's no, actually no data in the blue or green channels. And we can see that by, if we go to the blue channel, uh, sorry, the green channel, nope. The blue channel, nope. But go to the red channel and it's all there. So we want to edit the red channel on its own, independently. So in the channels here, I'm gonna to go to pixel red. I'm gonna right click it and say, create grayscale layer. And now I have a gray, I have the red channel out on its own. And this is the pure hydrogen alpha data. This is where all that goodness is. And I'm just gonna delete these layers because I'm trying to take strain off of my laptop. Usually I leave all my layers intact. And from here, I'm gonna do a, another astro curve, I think. See, look at our histogram now. It's getting nice and bright. We can actually see what we're doing. 
and the navigate on the left hand side is always useful because you can see what's happening in real time. That's excellent. I'm going to stamp another visible layer by using Control Alt Shift and E. I prefer the keyboard shortcut. I've been criticized before constructively about using less keyboard shortcuts, but I've shown you where to find it. It's under layer and merge visible, but I feel more comfortable using the keyboard shortcut. Okay, to me, if I'm doing just a narrowband HA image, I'm all about the contrast, like the deep background against like a, a nice smooth but contrasty nebula. And there's multiple ways of doing this. The first approach I'm going to do is the contrast curve, otherwise known as the S curve. So it's again, it's the curve adjustment layer. Curves are one of your biggest best friends when you're doing astrophotography editing. And what it is, is you pull it down on the left-hand side of the data spike and raise it up on the right-hand side. So we darken the background basically, but we're gonna raise the brightness of the nebulosity and this raises the contrast of the image. You'll see that the histogram gets thicker and it covers more of the dynamic range of the image. So one curve adjustment has done that. It's made the background a bit darker, but it's put a lot of contrast up in the DSO, made the image pop a bit more. From here, I'm gonna just stamp another layer. I, I like stamping a lot of interim layers. I, it's just one of my things. From here, I'm probably going to edit the background first and then I might edit the DSO individually. Now to edit the background, I'm going to go to select and sample color and I'm going to sample a bit of the background sky. I want intensity selected and then I'm going to sample the background sky. Intensity is going to select pixels as per their luminosity value. So basically how bright they are. That's why the background is being selected, not the DSO, because the DSO is a lot brighter. And I can change the tolerance. If I want to select more brighter pixels, I raise the tolerance. And if I want more darker pixels, I lower the tolerance. So for me, about 10% is great. I'm now going to feather this selection. Feathering is akin to a nice gentle slope. So if you picture a cliff face going into water, you walk along and you fall straight into the water. If you have a nice soft bankment where the, you go from land and gently into the water, it's a smoother transition. That's the best way I like describing uh, feathering. So I'm going to feather this by about 10. I'm going to click OK. And with the selection still in place, I'm going to create the curve adjustment layer. Now creating the adjustment layer with a selection in place automatically masks it. So if we Alt click this thumbnail, we can see it's put this mask in place for us. The key thing about a mask is black is hidden, white shows, and the intensity of the gray kind of like is a blend of the two. If there's a bit of gray, it kind of is translucent almost where you can see through it. What that means in English is wherever I'm doing this curve adjustment, this curve adjustment is going to apply in all the white parts of that mask but not in the black parts of the mask. Let me demonstrate. So we saw that the nebula was black. It was being hidden from this curve adjustment. So if I just crank this all the way up like this, you can see the background is being affected independently to the DSO. And this is how we're going to adjust the background and not the DSO. Look at this contrast we're now getting just by dropping it down in the shadows here. We're getting wonderful contrast and to me, that, that alone almost makes for a completed image. Look at that. I love that. That's a very nice result. And now if you wanted to, you can stamp this layer. And we can now select the DSO. So I'm going to go to select, sample color. I'm going to change it to intensity. I'm going to select the, the flaming star nebula here and I'll raise the tolerance here. About 50 works. Feather it again, always feather. I can't think of a single situation in my astrophotography editing where feathering is not a good thing. And I'm gonna show you something different this time. 
this is the pixel layer of what we finished, right? So this is the darker background with the normal DSO. I'm going to mask the pixel layer. And what this is now do, if I click this arrow, it opens up the, the selection of this mask. What this means I can now do is I can use other tools on the DSO alone to increase sharpening or noise reduction. Allow me to demonstrate. First of all, I want to use a curve adjustment, right? So I'm going to click the pixel there. I'm going to make my curve adjustment. I'm going to drag this curve adjustment into this collapsible menu, basically. So I'm going to put it into this pixel selection. This is the DSO adjustment. So this curve adjustment is in the DSO collapsed menu where the mask is. So this curves layer is now masked. It's kind of doing the same thing as when we made the background adjustments. So kind of doing the same thing as this background adjustments, but in a different way. So if I lower this down, you can see it's only affecting the DSO. In this case, the flaming star nebula. So I could anchor a point there if I wanted to and raise the brightness here a bit. Zoom in, kind of reducing the contrast so I can then maybe pull this down a bit here. Quite like that, that's okay for me. And here's the key reason why we've done this. I'm going to go into the develop module. Develop is one of my favorite tools. It's kind of like the camera raw feature in Photoshop, which I was very fond of. Develop is up here, develop persona. Now the develop persona, because we're applying it on that entire layer, but that layer is masked. Whatever we do in develop persona is only going to affect the DSO. So if I lower the general brightness of the image, Lower the highlights a bit. I can add a bit of clarity in for a bit of sharpening. Maybe a hair of contrast. Be careful with clarity. It's very easy to have death like clarity. I'm going to zoom in. It's a bit noisy. So I'll go to details and noise reduction. Then I can crank up the luminance to do a bit of noise reduction on this image. That's a bit much, so about 20%. And I'm going to hit develop. Now all that, all those adjustments we've made, the clarity, the noise reduction, the highlights, etc., has only been done to the DSO. So if I hide this layer, you can see what's happened. You can see the difference. Now that clarity adjustment has made it very crunchy. So I can actually go to this pixel layer and change that opacity to 66% and kind of just helps blend it a bit more. There we go. And if you think the background is a bit too dark now, here's where masking and adjustment layers really come into their own. If I go to the background adjustment layer and double click that thumbnail, it brings this back up. And I can make my adjustments to the background as I so wish without affecting the DSO adjustment layer. This is why adjustment layers like this and masking is such a powerful combination. So I can raise the background a bit so it's less crunchy, a bit more of a smoother transition. But this is dependent on how much contrast you want. And from there, you could do a bit of um, noise reduction to the background. So I could choose this pixel layer, just call that big background. So this pixel layer on the background can basically be the noise reduction I'm gonna do. So I'm just gonna go to filters and noise, denoise, 50%. And that's only affected the background. It would have affected the DSO if we'd done it sooner in the editing process. But remember, we've got DSO adjustment here, which is its own little ecosystem on its own. So we've gone from that to that. 
And that's basically editing a narrowband image. Again, if I'm making just a narrowband image on its own, so if I was going to present this like this, I would increase the contrast a bit more. I'd have it more punchy. I'd have the dark and the backgrounds a lot darker. I'd have the DSO a bit more, a bit more pronounced. If I'm going to make it into a HARGB image, I would have it a little bit less intense because when you blend it into the RGB, it affects things. I'll be doing a HARGB tutorial in the future as well. So this is like a baseline for that tutorial. And from here, I'm going to just stamp a mer uh, vi merge a visible layer. So again, you could go to um, layer and merge visible or use control, alt, shift and E. Again, I'm just going to delete these because I need to for my laptop's sake. And then from here, you can do noise reduction, further noise reduction if you want to, or you can do star reduction. So star red base. Star red. Right, so with star reduction, I'm just going to select my highlights. I'm going to go through this a bit quicker because I have a star reduction tutorial available. Uh, that's perfectly fine with me. Grow it by about two, circular. Yep. And feather that by about three. Filter, blur, minimum blur, before and after. 1.5 should be fine. Boom. And that's a bit too much for me, so I'm going to go to about 66%. And, and there you go. That's editing a narrowband image. From here, you could probably do a bit more sharpening if you want to, or any other further adjustments. See, the way I like to teach is I like to teach you the tools and why you use the tools, because then you can know the tools. You don't learn how to recreate this image, you learn how to make this image so you can apply it to your own. That's the way I like to teach. So that is editing narrowband images in Affinity Photo. A key difference would be if this was an Oxygen 3 image, then the data you would want would be between the uh, blue and green channels. And so you'd go into pixel green, create a grayscale level, and then pixel blue, create a grayscale layer, and set up to about 50% opacity and make a blend of the two and then make your edits from there. S2, Sulfur 2 would be in the red channel as well. So you'd do the same thing as I've just done here, but with Sulfur instead of Hydrogen Alpha. And that's that. From here, I'd be more than happy to share this image. Um, I would crop it now. So I'd go to my crop tool and uh, custom ratio, for example, and then I want it to be 16 by 9 for desktop about there and then I'd apply that crop see now this is um, 1920 by 1080 so full HD but this is one reason why I like to crop towards the end because then I'd have all those pixels to play with but that is my hydrogen alpha narrowband image in affinity photo Thanks very much for watching. I hope this tutorial has been helpful for you and you now know how to edit narrowband in Affinity. If you have any other requests for any other tutorials, drop them in the comments down below. And if this has been useful for you, also drop a comment down below. Hit the thumbs up if you've liked it. Hit the thumbs down if I could have done better. Until next time, thanks very much for watching. Hope you have clear skies. Keep looking up. Keep the cameras clicking. I'll see you later.